There are some Sundays when I feel a particular uh, thankfulness that God is big. And it's not up to this clay vessel, this clay pot that you see in front of you. I'm, and this is one of those Sundays. One of those Sundays I'm just feeling very thankful that God, you're doing the heavy lifting today. It's your spirit that's going to move and work. You're going to use clay pots like this one. And, but the power is in your word. The power is in the Holy Spirit being here amongst us, moving. And I love to remind us, I think it's important I, for my own heart, none of us are here by accident this morning. The God of all creation knew that you were going to be here this morning and is more than ready and prepared to tailor something to your heart. No doubt he already has through the worship, through a conversation, and he's going to do it through his word this morning. And I, I pray that for you on YouTube as well. You're tuning in. God knows where you are this morning, and he's going to meet you where you are with his word and his spirit, no doubt. And I pray that we're, uh, we're on tippy toes. I get to go to some pastor's meetings over the years here in the area. They're friends. I, that's important to me. And, and one of the pastors that we gather with would say, God, he would, when he would pray, he would say, God, we're on our tippy toes. We're on our tippy toes this morning. And I pray that that's the perspective of your heart already, that you're on your tippy toes. You're expecting God to speak to you and to, to adjust you. So, so we're going to um, start with some quotes about uh, the importance of friendship. Friendship is very important to God. In fact, Jesus at one point, the very Son of God, God in the flesh, said, I, I, don't, I, I call you friends to his followers. Friendship is very important. Genuine friendship is very important to God. It's very important to us here at Acacia Church. Here's one quote to warm up our minds on this idea of friendship. Uh, There's not a word yet for old friends who've just met. We, haven't kept, we don't have that in a word yet. Old friends meeting Jim Henson. Uh, we were together. I forgot the rest. I forget the rest. Walt Whitman. It's the friends that you can call up at 4 a.m. in the morning that matter. I knew when I met you an adventure was going to happen. One of my favorite personal theologians, uh, Winnie the Pooh. I knew when I met you an adventure was going to happen. Solomon, Proverbs, a sweet friendship refreshes the soul. And then a friend may be waiting behind a stranger's face. A friend may be waiting behind a stranger's face. That has been Cindy and Mai's experience as God has blended these two groups of Jesus followers together. When you were first strangers, we didn't know you. I was still trying to get names, new faces, we have come to experience behind those new faces are friends, dear friends, precious friends, friendships that have already deeply impacted Cindy and myself in a way that we are very, very grateful for. So we're continuing to ask God as leadership and as friends walking together, we are asking God, would you help us pursue genuine friendships together? So that we can experience the fresh hope of Jesus daily. Spencer, that's for you. Daily. When I first put the slide up, I forgot that word. And God moved Spencer Pingree's heart as we were thinking about this vision statement. No, let's remind people this is something that needs to happen every day. Every day. That we're asking God to help us pursue genuine friendships. So that we, in our marriages, in our friendships can experience fresh hope in Jesus. But then as we do that with Jesus, he will always say, you know what? There's room for one more. There's room for more. And anytime we talk about friendship with Jesus, that has an outpouring impact that we cannot stop. Genuine friendships in Jesus have an impact that looks out for others and that are waiting and expecting others to come, new friends to come. This is what the book of Philippians in the New Testament of the Bible is all about. It was written to followers of Jesus in the city of Philippi, and it's all about friendship. In fact, technically, it's called a friendship letter. These types of letters were floating around the Middle East during, during this time. Uh, and Paul takes that form and he writes this letter, and it's known as a 
friendship letter. But one of the more important verses in this letter of Paul to his friends in Philippi is toward the end in chapter 4 and verse 9. And he just says, the things that you've seen and heard in me in this letter, he says, I don't want you just to know them and to understand them. I want you to put them into practice. And that's what God is up to in our hearts today. He's going to help us see how this truth from Philippians about genuine friendship, he can actually put into practice in your life and in my life. Because God knows my life needs it in some deep and and very significant ways. So last week we looked at Paul and, and he was focused on some present circumstances that he was in. He was in prison. He's in prison, in a Roman prison. And he was focused on what was happening in his present. That was last week. But the section we're in this morning, he's looking forward. He's looking forward to his tomorrows, his future. And I need this personally. And I'm guessing to think that you might as well need something like this. Because it's too often, to be honest with you and to be straightforward with you, too often as I think about my tomorrows, there's anger, there's fear, there's anxiety, And there's sleeplessness. I don't have this down yet. There is still something in my life when there's too much, too many times for my liking. When I think about my tomorrow, I have trouble getting to sleep sometimes. There's anger, there's frustration, there's there's anxiety. So I need this. And Paul is very, very helpful for you and for me this morning. Because he's going to make a statement that is profound, it's simple. And one commentator who writes about the New Testament a lot said it might just be the sublimest, greatest statement that Paul said. And it's found in Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. If you've been walking with Jesus for a while, this is probably a fairly familiar statement with you. We're going to hang our thoughts on this statement from Paul. And it's found in Philippians 1, verse 21. And he says simply this, For to me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. As Paul looks at his tomorrow, the days that he doesn't know how they're going to turn out yet, he says, For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. He had two options. He was either going to be released from prison and live longer, or he was going to die in prison. Those were his two, two options. But sometimes, when the Bible is translated from the original language in the New Testament that it was written in Greek to English, sometimes things happen that maybe smooth things out a little bit that Paul didn't want to be smoothed out because he wrote it in a particular way. This is one of those verses. When we read verse 21, it says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. There's something that we're missing just a little bit, and I'm thankful for some of the people I read that know this language a lot better than I do. And and what they reminded me of and what I saw was, was Paul wanted this verse to be jarring. He wanted there to be an impact of this verse that perhaps is lost as it's smoothed out. So I'm going to ask you to stand, just to get the, honestly, just to get the blood moving for a couple seconds. Would you, you please stand with me for just a second? This is the sense that people that know the Greek language understand Paul was trying to get across, and it was simply this, life, Christ, die, gain. That stark, that rude, so to speak. Would you do that with me? Life, Christ, death, gain. That's it. Life is Christ. Death is better. It's gain. You can sit down. One more time. As you're sitting down, testing your coordination right now. <laughs> Life, Christ, die, gain. There's a, there's a piece in me that if you remember just that, walking away this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow, life, Christ, die, gain, something will be beneficial in your life. See, we need this because we live with a constant danger of being trapped. Trapped by our own culture, which is impactful on us. We've just got to recognize that. Our own weaknesses is, 
an impact on our lives. And if we're not careful, we will begin to think that the action of living is actually more about prosperity and health and good relationships and vacations and well-being and kids doing well in school and sports and jobs. That that's when we think about the action of life, that's what we think about. And it's not bad. But sometimes Jesus is actually an afterthought. Or maybe just a Sunday thought. He doesn't permeate life and work and prosperity and school and jobs and children. We think about that in one particular way and all of a sudden we think, oh yeah, Jesus is an afterthought. Or maybe just on Sunday. But Paul doesn't let us do that. And even if we think that about living, then then what about dying? When Paul says living is Christ, dying is gain, we don't think that. I I'm working on trying to figure out how to think about my last hour, my last day, in a, in a sense of gain even. Because sometimes when you and I think about dying, and for many people, maybe even you on YouTube this morning, when we think about that hour, that moment of our death, it's, it's fearful. We don't understand it. We're afraid. We avoid talk about dying. It's not something we're comfortable with. But it isn't certainly possibly something that we're thinking about that is gain or better than actually living. But how do we do this? And this is where I'm trusting God to give us wisdom this morning. So how do we live so Christ is life, permeates life? How do we do that? I think Paul gives us a couple thoughts that were helpful for me to think about. The first is found in Philippians 1, 18 and 19, and it's simply this. We pray more with more confidence. How do we live as Christ is in our life? We pray more. Because prayer at its fundamental root is an expression of dependence. We pray because we need God. If we're not praying, we're we're doing okay. We're kind of moving on. We can handle this. Prayer is a fundamental statement of dependence on God. So if we want to know what Christ is life is more about. We will pray more and we will pray with more confidence. Verses 18 and 19. This is paralleling and tying the, the last, two sec- last section with this one. But what does it matter, Paul says, the important thing, whether I'm in chains or with you, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. Even if followers were trying to make it hard for Paul or, or not, or others were on his team, so to speak, If Christ is preached, that's what he was rejoicing in. And he says, and yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know, I know fundamentally in the depths of my being that through your prayers and God's provision of the spirit of Jesus, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. And that deliverance in Paul's mind is either I'm going to live more on this earth, or my deliverance is going to be, I'm going to see Jesus. My next breath is going to be with him. So either way, deliverance. But Paul knew this. Paul knew that his deliverance was going to turn out for the good of Christ in his life. And he knew that because God was providing the spirit of Christ in him. And it was through prayers. This is another one of those instances in the translation to English. It it wouldn't be bad just to leave out that, that conjunction and, for I know that Through your prayers, God provides the Spirit of Jesus Christ. That we don't separate prayers and the provision of the Spirit of God in our lives. We think of them as one. And commentators were fascinating and strong about this. There is a link between our prayers and God supplying the Spirit of God in our needs and in our concerns that He wants us to know and have a greater confidence in. So that when you pray, for your children, for your spouse, for your friends, for your neighbors. When you pray for them, there is a connection. There's a link between the Spirit of God showing up in their lives in a fresh way. Paul knew that. That's one of the things I've been praying is that you and I would grow in that knowledge and that confidence that when we pray, we are not just mouthing words into empty air. When we pray, God is hearing and he is moving in a fresh way in the lives of our friends, people that we know and love and care about, in a provision of the Spirit of God is his Spirit in their lives. That we would have a confidence of that. We would know that. 
That's how one way that we can know that Christ is life. When we pray, we know that he's moving through his spirit and we have a confidence of that. So I'm just wondering, um, who was praying for me this morning? Somebody was praying for me this morning. Because this morning was one of those mornings when I woke up and for some reason was, was fairly tired. And that's challenging for me to get past sometimes on Sunday morning in particular. I, would, I was tired. I was also irritated. I was ticked because I ran yesterday and in a stretch when I was coming up from one of the stretches I do, I must have strained something in my left knee and I was hobbling and I was irritated because it was a reminder, <laughs> I'm getting older. I can't even do a simple stretch anymore and come away from that okay. I hurt myself in a simple, and it was a warm stretch, by the way. It, was, it wasn't a kind of a stupid cold stretch. No, it was a warm stretch, and I still did something. So this morning, I was feeling that. I'm thinking about, how am I going to get up here? That's why I told Bill I practiced with the stand this morning, because I didn't want to hobble up here in front of you. So I was irritated. I was frustrated. I was tired this morning. Somebody was praying. I know at least Jesus was, because the scripture says he intercedes for us. I also know the Holy Spirit was interceding for me. But who knows? If I crossed your mind this morning and you just breathed a prayer for me, thank you. Because the Spirit of God is showing up right now. It's actually, thank God for the Spirit of God and, and some Advil, to be honest. Um, I was able to get up here without too much joy. But, but there's a link between how the Spirit of God is showing up in me and no doubt somebody praying. And I'm thankful for that, deeply thankful, at a deeply emotive place in my life right now, even this morning. But that's what God is up to in us. When we pray, there is a fresh application of the Spirit that in the mystery of prayer happens. And I just pray that that emboldens you, encourages you as you pray that you have a confidence, the Spirit of God's doing something you may never know about until you actually see Jesus. And he says, let me tell you what happened that day. When you prayed, this is what happened. So we pray more, and we pray with more confidence as Christ shows up in our life. Secondly, though, how do we live so Christ is life? Our everyday hope is that Jesus will be magnified in our lives. Philippians 1.20. Paul writes this. I eagerly expect and I hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but that I will have sufficient courage for the moment, for the day, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. That word exalted can also be translated magnified. That Christ is magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. And Paul has an expectation of that. He has a hope that that's going to happen in his life. As he goes through the day, Christ will be magnified. Uh, Warren Wearsby is a, a Bible teacher that has written a lot of books and his series are called Be. Uh, and I really appreciate him. It's, and, and his, one of his thoughts about Philippians, I read his commentary this past week. And he brought up an interesting point about this very word magnified, is that Jesus can be something like a, a, a telescope. As we live with Christ in us, our lives can be something of a telescope. You see, a telescope takes something that is really far away and makes it feel like it's like right here. Something really far can become close. And as you and I live Jesus through our days, that's what God is doing. All of a sudden, Jesus is near. As we speak about Jesus in our homes and with our friends, and as God opens up opportunity and we move on boldness as he's moving us and giving us opportunities, some people might have a sense, and maybe friends on YouTube, you might have this sense that God is yet yeah, very, very far away like that planet, like that star. But when you look through the telescope, all of a sudden that becomes close. And Paul prays that Christ would be magnified, that the sense of God being far away would be changed, and then all of a sudden Jesus and his presence would be close. But the other way in which Christ can be magnified in our lives is, is like a microscope. 
something that is small is made large. And that also can happen as we just live our lives, that if we think that God is small, Jesus is small, that we just live our lives with our spouses, our friends, our children, colleagues, neighbors, all of a sudden Jesus maybe becomes just a little bit bigger when he was small in their thinking. Our everyday hope is that Jesus would be magnified in our lives, that he would be close and that he would be bigger. The third thing that that helps me in my thinking of what it means for Paul, what he's trying to get across for Christ to be our life, is that our everyday conversations would encourage confidence in Christ. Everyday conversations, the ones we have around our tables, the ones we have in the cars, the one we have just as we live life in our homes, at work, with our friends, conversations on the street, that we would encourage confidence in Christ as God would bring up opportunities to do that. And he says this in First Philippians chapter 1, verse 24 through 26. He says, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. When he was stressed, He was anxious. We're going to talk about, we're going to see Paul was anxious. So what's going to happen now? Am I going to be with you? Am I going to be away from you? And he says, but it's more necessary because it looks like I'm going to be with you for a while. It's more necessary for you that I remain in this body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you in Philippi for your progress, the advancement of the gospel in your lives, and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ will abound on account of me. If you're like me, you might wrestle with the sense of what does it mean to boast in Christ? Because I have a negative connotation of what it means to boast. And it's some sort of a a wrong pride. But God needs to flip that meaning in our understanding, in our minds. When we boast about Christ, it's like we are, look at him. Our pride is in Christ. Our boasting is in Christ. A good synonym is confidence. Our confidence is in Christ. That's who we're confident about. Jeremiah knew this, the prophet Jeremiah in the Old Testament. And he encourages you and me, even though this was written thousands of years ago, it's life today for you and for me. And and the prophet Jeremiah says this, let not the wise put confidence in, In their wisdom, let not the wise boast about their wisdom or the strong boast about their strength or the rich boast about their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. As you well know, we live in one of the most highly educated counties in the the United States. We also live in the richest county in the United States. If there's any group of people that need to be wary and challenged and encouraged to think again, what do we put our confidence in? What do we boast about? It would be very easy for the likes of us to say, it's in my wisdom, it's in my degrees, it's in my intellect, and all of a sudden we feel really pretty good about that because we're smart, we're quick, our intellect, our words, our ability to to reason has gotten us where we are. We're making a lot of money. We live in huge houses because of our intellect. Because of our intellect, we have a lot of money, richest county in the United States, and, and it's a trap. We have to be wary We don't put our confidence in our intellect and in our money. That's what Jeremiah says. No, we boast. We put our confidence in Christ. He's the one who gives us the very ability to make money, to make wealth. He's the one who has given us our intellect. We cannot take any credit for the intellect that we possess. God has graciously given that to you and to me, and he's our confidence. He's our glory. So there's a song. It's entitled Boast in the Cross by a group called Wren Collective. Cindy's been listening to that for a while. 
She shared that as we were talking about this message. She shared that song with me, and so we listened to it together just Friday. I printed out the the lyrics to that song, and I contemplated just a little bit, and what they encourage us to do is to think about Christ as the frame, and we got the next slide coming up. They talk about boasting in Christ, boasting in the cross, because Christ is the frame of our lives. This has helped me to understand, what does it mean when we say that I have confidence in Christ? It means that he's the one that frames our lives. I encourage you just to meditate, contemplate. How is it that Christ can frame your life? How does he do that? So that he becomes more life indeed. He's the stabilizer. When everything's up in the air, we're not sure how things are going to land. Jesus is the one that brings stability to our lives. No matter what our day holds, he brings stability. He's the anchor. Even though the waves are rough and things are all over the place in our emotions, in our finances, in our health, there's an anchor to all of that movement and upheaval, and it's Christ. And there's a sense that as our days are in upheaval, there is this sense of anchor, and it's Christ. He's also the gravity. He's the one that we're just kind of naturally drawn to. He's our focus. He's the centerpiece. I so appreciate those lyrics in that song. I encourage you to listen to that. Boast in the Cross by Wren Collective. As Carrie prayed, Cindy's having hip replacement surgery uh, Tuesday. This is one reason why this song and this truth has been so important to Cindy. Christ is her life in the midst of this major surgery that she's anticipating. He is her frame, her stabilizer, her anchor, the gravity of her life, the focus. He is her centerpiece. And she's anticipating this this event that is also bringing quite a bit of anxiety, to be honest with you. But that anxiety is mixed with stability, mixed with stability and, and confidence that Jesus is going to show up, especially in those first few hours, that first day or two. She's been through this once before. We kind of know what's going on, and that's a good and a bad thing. But she does have this confidence that Christ is going to be her life. So that's some of Paul's thoughts on how do we live so Christ is our life. But then how do we live so that dying is far better? What does he say about that? Philippians 1, and 23, he says this. For I am torn, this is verse 23, Paul says, I'm torn between the two. I'd like to be with you. It would mean progress in the faith. I love being with you. Um, But my desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Far better to be with Christ. So how does God work this in our lives? I need this to be worked in my life. I love Cindy, I love you, I love Karis, I love Anna, our family. There's there's a big part of me that really likes the life God has given to me, and I like being able to do it with you and us, and I really like that. It's meaningful, deeply meaningful. I need to contemplate more that first breath in heaven. What's that first breath in heaven going to be like? And I use that intentionally because the Bible is very clear. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Friends on YouTube, you might be very fearful, understandably so, of death. And the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord. The fear of death is something that the gospel of Jesus Christ really helps us mitigate and put in a good place. So we contemplate that first breath of heaven. This is not my idea. This is what the Apostle Paul says in his letters to the followers of Jesus in the city of Corinth. In verse 18 of chapter 3 of his second letter, he says, And we all then, with unveiled faces, we contemplate the Lord's glory. I mean, we, we don't just take a glance at what that means. We don't just give it a passing thought. That means we take some time to meditate and think about what that first breath in heaven is going to look like. What's it going to feel like. 
Because as we do that, as we contemplate the Lord's glory, we are being transformed, metamorphosis. We are going to be changed into his image from ever increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the spirit. As we contemplate that first breath in heaven, God changes us. He transforms us. He gives us a deeper sense of, man, I can't wait. I can't wait for that. The early leaders of the church looked into heaven and he saw Jesus standing. Stephen. Solomon in Ecclesiastes, the wisest man in the world, says it's better to go to funerals than it is to go to parties. You learn more at a funeral than you do at a party and funerals, the destiny of all of us. Ecclesiastes 7. And Jesus himself, the writer of Hebrews says, who for the joy set before him the joy that Jesus was looking forward to, who for the joy set before him, he endured the cross. He stayed when it was hard because he was anticipating the joy. When we contemplate the glory of God, seeing Jesus for the first time, it transforms us, changes us, gives us a hope for tomorrow. Everything will be better. Mysteries will be understood. We'll see what God is up to. I encourage you to contemplate that first breath of heaven. My brother's passing just a, about a year and a half ago. I, I did that in a fresh way. What was that like for my brother Rob to have his first breath in heaven? My mom and dad are here. We've done that a couple times. What's that like? I encourage you to do that. I just want to close um, our time before the worship, as the worship team comes back up, is, is just pray through this just a bit. Um, I encourage you to do that too, that we would seal this time by praying um, some of our heart thoughts to the Lord. So let's take a moment and pray, and then the worship team will, will wrap us up this morning. Father, I thank you that you did meet us here this morning. Your spirit, no doubt, has spoken, <clears throat> even to friends that have not yet said a yes to Jesus, that you've spoken to wherever we are in our journeys and Father, I pray that you would continue just to grow genuine friendships. To know what it means as we live together as friends that you are our life. And it's better when we see you. And we look forward to that day. Father, please take these words, your words, and please help us live this in a way that makes significant difference in our afternoon, tomorrow morning, in our marriages relationship with our children, friends, colleagues, and neighbors. Father, to your honor and to your glory, we boast in you. We're proud of you, Father, and Jesus. You are our confidence. And so we pray this in the precious and the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.
Son to save for oh God. Jesus is waiting, God so 